I would like to welcome you to the 57th annual Founders Day celebration. I'm an alcoholic, and my name is Pat Price. I'm privileged to be up here this morning and to chair this uh, Sunday morning meeting. And I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the fact who is going to share their experience, their strength, and their hope with you this morning. When I was given this honor and privilege to choose the speaker for you this morning, I knew who I wanted to ask. There was no doubt in my mind. Um, I was given Bob's tape before I came in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and I have listened to several of his tapes in my recovery, and they have helped me immensely. And I would like to share with you that this weekend has been an experience that God's grace has given me. And um, we have had moments, um, Bob and I and his lovely wife, Tina, to sit down one-on-one -on -one and share our views on different issues and I'm not going to stand here and tell you that my views with Bob are always the same because they are different. But I have learned to respect his opinion, and he has certainly respected mine. And we have had moments of laughter, and that you won't be surprised to know that we have had moments of tears. Because in the time that I have been sober, I have never met anyone so honest, that deals with feelings, as Bob does, and he don't let anything get past you. <laughs> I know that a lot of you that are here this morning are here because you know that he's leading. And it has truly been an honor for me. And with no more from me, I would like to present this morning Bob Earl from Tucson, Arizona. Thank you. Love you, too. Oh, I intend to. <laughs> you notice some of the committee isn't here. <laughs> I am Bob Earl. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. A true rocket scientist, I am. This is a hell of a family reunion, you know that? This is, you know. I didn't have a lot to say about my first family, but I've had a lot to say about my adopted family. And um, this is just, you know, uh, my family reunions, um, everybody was always drunk. They were either drunk on alcohol or drunk on food or drunk on religion, but they were drunk on something, you know. They weren't there, whatever the hell was going on. And to be here and to experience this has really been, I mean, I've cried so much this weekend, Tina and I. It's been just a delight. We came from the airport, didn't even uh, get our bags put away, and, and, um, and Bill took us over to Dr. Bob's house. Let's see, Bill and Bob went to Dr. Bob's house, and... Uh, and, and Tina and I just sat in the living room and, and cried, you know, just feeling the feelings there. This is where it began, you know. And that just knocks me out. Because I'm, a, you know, I'm of the mind that I didn't have a chance without alcohol and drugs. Not a chance. And I didn't have a chance without AA. It's fascinating, you know. I took them both. And so to be where it all began has been really touching for me. I was, um, um, when Pat called me, I, <laughs> this is interesting. I didn't know if I was going to tell this story or not. She called me and asked me to speak. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. I'd be, I'd be honored to come speak at Founders Day. 
and I hung up the phone and went and got my wife. This, fortunately, is still the same one as when they asked me to speak. <laughs> which is saying a hell of a lot for me, actually. And, and I sat down in her lap, and I started to cry, and I said, My God, you know, I've been asked to come speak at Founders Day at the Sunday morning meeting. I said, I almost feel forgiven, you know? It, it's like, I feel like I've been on the outside for so long, and the subject is so much controversy, and all I have ever done is share my experience, strength, and hope. You know? Now, I do have to admit, I have one real bad problem. And that is, when I get a hold of something that helps me in my recovery, I have a tendency to be a bit pushy the first month or so that it's really working and can make others extremely uncomfortable with the way in which I present my newfound information. I remember I was quite a problem in Los Angeles when I quit smoking. <laughs> so it's like I can understand why people get upset, you know, when I just can't quietly let them know what I'm doing without telling them what they're doing wrong at the same time. So, and then this morning we, um, you know, Pat arranged for us to have um, some rides on bikes out to the cemetery and back. What a trip that was. Man. And I haven't been on one since I laid one down 38 years ago, so it's been a little while for Bobby. <laughs> And I cried halfway out to the cemetery, cried at the cemetery, and cried half the way back from the cemetery. You know, I was just so moved by that. And so moved by the bikers and the clubs, you know, people who would not have a chance if they didn't have that, you know. It's like, and I can remember all the bullshit when that first started. Everybody went crazy. Oh, my God, you know. Wow, what a beautiful thing it is now. And they're mumbling about the um, Akron Police Department is not too happy with the whole thing because it takes manpower so I'd like to make a suggestion to all the clubs that are here, man, is when you go home, write a letter to the Akron Police Department in general and to the officers who are out there in the street in specific and thank them for taking their time to make it possible, you know? Let them know how important it is, man. Let them know how much it means to, to you. And let them know what an, uh, an incredibly powerful message you are. All together, riding sober and clean to that cemetery. Yeah. Boy, this is not a good way to start off a talk. There's no way to go. Where, where the hell do you go from here, you know? <laughs> well, um, August 28th um, this year, I will celebrate my 30th anniversary in Alcoholics Anonymous. much to the amazement of a lot of people, <laughs> and to the dismay of others. I love my adopted family a lot, but I'm also of the mind that in the big book, one of the most important lines to me today is it says, God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. And it's been almost 60 years now. Wow. And in that time, God has disclosed a lot, you know? And I sometimes think people aren't listening to what's being disclosed, and I get angry, you see? And when I get angry, then I criticize my family. And I say, God damn it. People are dying. We're losing people like crazy. 
crazy at five, six, seven years. Somebody wake up, man. You know, this isn't all just about the newcomer. I mean, the newcomer is the most important person in the room if you, this is a furnace, you know, and you're looking for coal. But if this is a fellowship, then every one of us is important and of immense value, you know? And I'll tell you something that I find fascinating. The more important I have become to me, the more important you have become to me. You know? It's really true. So sometimes I get a little wound up and I criticize my family. And people get nuts because I criticize my adopted family. My God, I happen to be of the mind that my adopted family is big enough to withstand a little criticism and not fall apart, you know? I may not even be right. <laughs> what does that matter? In, in, a, in, a, in a functional system, there's room for more than one opinion. You know, that's all. There's room for everybody's opinion. You can accept it or reject it. So this morning, I'm going to share my experience, strength, and hope. Not yours. I wasn't asked to share yours. I'm not going to share your program. I'm going to share mine. I'm not here to tell you what kind of program to work. I'm telling you what kind I work. The kind I work may drive you absolutely crazy. You might think, my God, if I did that, I would die. Perhaps that's true. I really don't know. All, all I know is I'm here to talk about me. I rolled into the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous at 26 years of age. I didn't have a lot left. I was living in doorways and sleeping on rooftops. I consumed an awful lot of narcotics along with my alcohol, so I had some serious wiring problems in the brain. <laughs> I had trouble knowing my name, where I was, getting lost, stuff like that. And I began to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. An Eskimo came along, snatched me out of my doorway, and I wound up at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Didn't like it. Did not like the people. I was in Pasadena, California. No one had suffered, as far as I could see there. You know, they had an embarrassing social occasion, quit drinking, and had been happy ever since, you know. But in my, mind, in my heart, I knew one thing, that I did not want to drink again. That's all I knew. And people said, do you want what we have? I didn't know what you had. I didn't have enough going on to be able to figure out what you had. It was beyond my comprehension, you know? So people shook my hand and poured me coffee and took me to meetings and picked me up and showed me where the coffee shops were and showed me where the meetings were and, you know, helped me get a job painting a house so I could earn enough money to buy some cigarettes. And they took care of me. By the time I was about a year sober, I had a job, I had a car, I had guys I was sponsoring now. I was showing them where the coffee shop was, and I was showing them where the meetings were, and I was helping them to get jobs and to get a couple of bucks so they could buy some cigarettes or, you know, whatever they needed. And what touched me the most about being here and being in Bill, Bob's house was um, that it started here, you know. That, that the hand that was extended to me 30 years ago started here. That's um, very moving to me. After I got a year, they said, you need to go back into institutions, Bob, and carry the message to people that are locked up. I said, I don't want to go. <laughs> I didn't get mine in there. Let them get out and get it out here like I did, you know. I always was a warm, caring person, great concern for my fellow addicted brother. They informed me if I didn't carry the message back in there, I'd wind up living back in there. So I went back and I carried the message back in there. I had job problems in the beginning. I had big job problems. I had no education, no career, and a um, somewhat faulty attitude. 
had trouble getting jobs, had trouble keeping jobs. It wasn't all that, wasn't just blissful, you know, it wasn't, I also, like the one guy said, at one point I became a thermodynamics engineer, I told a few lies on the application. <laughs> I couldn't even spell thermodynamics, man. Tell you how smart industry in this country is in trouble, they gave me the job. I didn't last long, but I had a good time while I was an engineer. What the hell, you know? <laughs> always wanted to be an engineer, and I became one. Because I was always trying to control and maneuver and manipulate crap. Might as well be an engineer, you know, and do it, you know, with legally or get paid for it anyway. Oh, God, lost that job, a few others, four years clean and sober, wound up working in a car wash for a buck and a quarter an hour, sleeping on a couch of one of my babies. I borrowed money by that point from everybody I sponsored. <laughs> I had started in the car wash at $1.35 an hour. <laughs> so I'd been demoted by a dime already, and I'd only been there a month. I got a rash from the detergents, so, you know, in soap in those days, in the car wash, you got an extra dime for, you know, putting soap on, and I got a rash. I broke out in this horrible rash from the detergents, so I, they had to move me to the other end, the drive-off end. So now I'm bouncing in and out off hot car seats all day long. <laughs> well, I don't know about those of you who've been in institutions and sat on a lot of concrete, but I happen to have hemorrhoids like most people who've sat on a lot of concrete. And the hot car seats just brought my hemorrhoids back out. <laughs> so I'm four years clean and sober, sponsoring a lot of people, carrying a very good message, sleeping on my baby's couch, making a buck and a quarter an hour. My hemorrhoids are out, and I haven't had sex in about four months. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to taking my fourth cake, because I don't feel I have a lot to offer the newcomer at this point in my recovery. So I told my friends I wasn't going to take one, you know, I mean, what am I going to say? I mean, at that point, central office would call me with a 12-step call. I'd have to call the guy up, find out if he had a car and was sober enough to drive it so he could pick me up so I could take him to me. Well, an Eskimo drove through the car wash, offered me another job, and I went and I took it and I became a die caster. So I was making more money and I liked that a lot. And it was hot work, but it was okay. It didn't require a lot of thinking. Making pretty good money, had a little apartment, and I was just trying to get by. <clears throat> now, I was having, one of the reasons I was having a small amount of difficulty was that they had said to me early on in recovery, if you have a problem, Bob, turn it over. Now, I like that concept. Um, actually, I would have liked to have put it all in a box and given it to somebody, you know, <laughs> and just walked away. <clears throat> but I had to ask the really fatal question. I said, turn it over to who? They said, God. I said, who's God? I said, God is your father. Not a good image. Not a good image. My father was an alcoholic. I have no memory ever of my father picking me up and holding me to his heart and telling me that he loved me or that I was important or that I counted at all for anything. So I found it real hard to believe that if this God was my father, that he had my best interest in mind. So I had successfully stayed sober for almost <clears throat> for four and a half years and had avoided surrendering at least spiritually. Finally, the pain became so severe it was essential that I surrender. I surrendered, went to work the next day, and broke my back. My mind, which has always been highly supportive of my, me and my life, said, see, huh, I told you, the minute you let God know where you were, he was going to get you. And you told him, and he got you. And by that point in my recovery, I was so tired of listening to this thing. And isn't it noisy? My God, it just chatters and chatters and chatters. And about stuff it knows nothing about, you know. God, it's got an opinion on everything. It'll get in debates with educated people on subjects that's never even, heard, you know, incredible what it will do. 
so I decided I wasn't going to listen to it anymore. Perhaps breaking my back was a good deal. I didn't know. Now, in retrospect, as I look back, I can see that it was really necessary because one of my ways of avoiding me, staying out of me and away from my feelings, is by going fast, being busy, thinking, doing, driving, running, fixing, arranging, meaning, you know, just quit locked into TV, anything but to slow down and feel whatever it is that's going on inside here. Well, when I broke my back and they put me in the braces and all the rest of that stuff, I had suddenly been effectively slowed down. I had a lot of trouble with vocational rehabilitation, big trouble with them. First, they wanted me to be a social worker because of my membership in Alcoholics Anonymous. They had every piece of paper that had anything to do with my history in front of them, and they wanted me to be a social worker. In my jacket, it says real clear, according to the Board of Criminal Psychiatry of the State of California, which I won't comment on, I am a homicidal social psychopath with an inability to function in a society in a, that, in a, that contains people in a free world or incarcerated without reacting to that society with extreme violence. So I pointed out to the people at Vocational Rehab, I had never, you know, seen that as a qualification for social worker, you know? And if they were missing the point, I didn't like people. And that hadn't changed. I still didn't like people, you know? So they gave me aptitude tests. I took five of them and came out five different things. I wasn't being a smart ass either. I was just being real honest. I, was just, I wanted to find out who I was too. You know, we were both trying to accomplish the same thing. And I would answer the questions as honestly as I could that day based on how I felt that day. And I was in different moods, so I answered the questions differently. Six months went by, and one night I'm reading an article in TV Guide that says, how would you like to be a writer? This little voice down in here, I hadn't heard before, all the voices had been here, said to me, let's do that. My mind, of course, my biggest fan, immediately got hysterical. Ah, uh -huh, right. Yeah, go be a writer, stupid, you know. You've, you've failed English since the fourth grade. You're a phonetic speller. Yeah, be a writer. You don't know what a verb is or an adjective is. Go ahead, be a writer. And I kept this little presence inside of me, just said, try it, try it, try it. Well, I was at the end of my rope. You know, I didn't know what the hell else to do. Voc Rehab was getting tired of me. I was getting tired of them. The whole situation, I was tired of being on disability. I was just tired. Went down, took in the TV guide, handed it to my counselor, said, I'd like to do this. She got hysterical. She gave it to her boss, and because I was the one black mark at the Van Nuys Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, he was thrilled to get me off the rolls, and he signed up for the course for me. Through Eskimos, which are the people that just appear when you need them to give you what you need, I wrote my first story, submitted it to a studio, they bought it, I became a television writer. Now the interesting thing about this was, I wasn't able to enjoy it. And the first night I sat home and I watched my very first show that I had written on television. Man, you got this? This is Bobby, you know, alcoholic addict, street kid from Los Angeles, from just this total loser, man, sitting in his living room and on the television on NBC, National Broadcasting Company, all across the country, this show was on the air and going to be watched by tens of millions of people, and it said, written by Robert Earl. And everybody in that room with me was more excited about that 
than I was. You see? And they said, it must be great. Wow, wow, wow. Look, your name, your name, your name. Wow, jeez, great. I said, yeah, it's nice. Because, see, there had been one thing haunting me, and that was my earliest memory is that I'm not okay. My earliest memory is that there's something wrong with me. Somehow, I'm flawed. There's something about me that's just not okay. I'm, I'm when it push comes to shove, I'm insufficient, inadequate, incomplete. And if you find that out, I will, you will make me go away. And I have spent my life trying to keep that a secret, that I feel that way. It didn't change when I got in recovery. All I did was create one more new personality, you know? I called it my recovery personality. I put it on in the parking lot of the Alano Club, you know? I probably pulled into the parking lot of the Alano Club and after chasing some guy down the street 90 miles an hour, screaming obscenities at him about how I was going to kill him, roll into the parking lot of the Alano Club, get out of my car, put on my spiritual smile. I am, after all, a recovering alcoholic who is working these steps. Stroll into the club, take my chair, get my cup, you know, don't, don't, don't have change, you know, don't sit in a different chair, <clears throat> just die in the same chair, drinking out of the same cup. And when it became my turn, I had some really wonderful spiritual things to say about recovery, neglecting to mention the fact that I was willing to, you know, slaughter 50 citizens while trying to get at this one guy out in the street prior to coming into the meeting. That just didn't seem necessary. It seemed to me that if I told you that, I would be showing you that part of me which I was ashamed of, so horribly ashamed of. Well, I kept right on writing and uh, rolled into about 10 years of recovery, and by that time I'd been a writer for five years. And uh, also at that time, a woman I had married four months previous died <clears throat> from cancer. Once again, I was really quite okay to be around. I was a delightful person to be around because I didn't put any pressure on the people around me because I was a spiritual giant. And when people, and by that I mean I was so cut off from my feelings, I didn't know what the hell was going on, is what was happening, you know. And people would walk up to me and said, oh my God, we're so sorry to hear about Taylor. So sorry to hear. I'd say, it's okay. Her father took her home. She is in heaven where she belonged. So my friends didn't have to run away from me. I didn't put stress on them. I didn't grieve or cry or scream my pain because I wasn't in touch with it. Now, for a long, long time in recovery, on really, really bad days, I would wake up in the morning and I would say to myself, you're sober. You're sober today. And I'd go, yes, right on. I didn't drink today. I'm doing okay. Somewhere around the 11th year of my sobriety, I woke up one morning and I ran into a terrible, terrible wall. Or pit, if you want to call it that. Being grateful for being sober was no longer enough. It didn't fix it. I just wanted to die. That was it. Now, by that time, I had probably sponsored a thousand people. I had probably given 5,000 AA talks. I had probably driven 200,000 miles carrying the message of AA, hauling newcomers, going to prisons. And I'd probably written 16 inventories. I had made amends. I had gone back and faced people who wanted to kill me. I went back and faced people who told me they were sorrier than hell that I found a way to live and really wished I had stayed a hopeless, you know, drunk. 
I'd done it all. I did what was asked of me by the steps in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I wanted to die. But I kept going to meetings, and I kept sponsoring people, and I kept writing television scripts, and I kept making more money, and I kept going through wives, <clears throat> like underwear, and I kept, you know, and nobody says anything, which breaks me up. You know, as wife number three, wife number four, wife number five, you know, you would think somebody would have said something, you know. I was saying something to me, for Christ's sakes, you know. I kept walking down the aisle, and this little voice in me kept saying, I don't think this is a good idea, you know. And I kept saying to this little voice, shut up. You know, you don't understand. I'm not complete, man. I got, I got some serious, you know, flaws inside of me. And when I have a mate, then I have a wife, and then I'm married, and I'm a married man. And when I'm a married man, and I have a pretty wife, I'm okay. So shut up. And I'd say I do one more time, you know. Well, I tried other things, you know. I gave up eating red meat, and I gave up coffee, and gave up sugar, gave up cigarettes, you know. I kept giving stuff up. Now, what this did for me is I kept getting crazier. <laughs> See? Because with each little addiction I threw out, I started getting really loony to it. Because stuff was... Feelings were starting to come up. I did not know what they were. I did not know what to do with them. There were no feelings in my family except rage. My dad was a drunk and my mother was a child beater. And I am the only child from that family. And I was the target of her beatings, you know, for the first five and a half years of my life. And I wondered why I thought there was something wrong with me, right? Seventeen years sober, I could have been a poster child for AA, you know? I could have been, man. Here I was, this loser street kid, 17 years, clean and sober, television writer, money coming in in the wheelbarrow full, living in a penthouse apartment at the beach, dating a gorgeous young girl, divorcing an expensive, gorgeous wife. I'm in the Hollywood dream, right? I told Tina when we got married, I said, you know, when I tell you you're a good wife, it means something. <laughs> she takes delight in being Mrs. Earl number seven. <laughs> well, I'm sure glad, because I got awful tired of being beaten up for it by other women, you know. Wake up in the morning, they look at me and say, do you understand how diminished I feel by the fact you've been married five times? I thought, what am I supposed to do about that, you know? So then I would just feel ashamed and apologize for, you know, something I had no control over and buy them something, you know? Or give them a credit card to go shopping with. I learned to stop that finally. Boy, nobody can shop like a mad woman. Man, let me tell you. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> God, I had one girlfriend who could slam dunk Rodeo Drive, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> but I was afraid of angry women, so I'd do anything to keep a woman from getting angry at me. And I never understood why, see? If I encountered you in a traffic situation where you cut me off and made me mad, and you were a guy, man, I'd say, hey, you know, come on, let's do this. If you were a woman, I'd be apologizing, backing up, begging my, you know, let me out of here, don't hurt me. And I never could figure that out. That never made any sense to me, you know? And then, in all my, all my recovery, I always picked sexually aggressive women. I liked them a lot, until they got sexually aggressive, and then I hated them. And I thought... <laughs> God, what's going on here, you know? So I got this whole life going, and I don't understand what's happening to me, okay? All these dumb things. And I'm, I, I remember one time I wrote a script for um, the Starsky and Hutch show. I wrote it in four days because they were in a hurry, and I wrote it about somebody dying. And it was the first time I opened myself up to write about the pain that I had felt over the wife I had lost. 
And I turned the script in, jumped on a plane, ran away to Hawaii because I knew it was terrible because I wrote it in four days, man. And I get over in Hawaii, and I'm not there, but about three days, and a letter shows up in the mailbox of this girl I'm staying with from the producers. And I go, oh, God, you know, I'm standing here reading the letter through the envelope, of course. You know, one of the fascinating things I discovered about functional people, which amazes me, is they open the mail. <laughs> you know? They look at it, turn around, open it, and read it. You know, I go nuts for an hour before I open it, you know. Oh, God. Particularly if it's from the IRS. I can do some real numbers on them. So, um, you know, she said, like, why don't you open it, which <laughs> seemed really an unnecessary suggestion. Because I knew in this envelope it was going to tell me that that was the worst script that they had ever read in their lives. And not only was I through working for that specific show and that specific studio, I was through, period, in the town. I opened the envelope up and I took out the letter and the letter was informing me that that was one of the two most beautiful scripts they had ever had written for the series since it had been on the air. And it was such a powerful show they wanted to pay justice to it and they were not going to rush it into production like they had originally intended. They were going to wait for me to come back to make some minor changes, and then they would do it when they had time to do it right. Do you know what my first thought was? At least they aren't mad at me. That was it. That was the best I could do. Seventeen years sober, I've got all this stuff going. Writer, money beauty, penthouses, expensive cars. Everything I thought would fix it. And once again, I was getting up every single morning of my life and the first thought that came to my mind was if it gets too tough today, I can kill myself. Now by this time, I don't know how many talks I've given and how many conventions I've been to and how many people I've sponsored and how many <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of miles I have driven and I have written at this point in my to recovery 32 inventories. Well, in a heated argument with this young lady, this, God put her and I together to speed up our growth. <clears throat> We were helplessly and hopelessly attracted to each other sexually, and we couldn't stand the sight of each other <laughs> two minutes after we were done. <clears throat> so it put a lot of pressure on our lives. We could push each other's buttons simply by walking into the room, you know? And the other one would go nuts. So in a heated argument, she said to me one day, referring to my five previous wives, she said, did you ever stop to think for one minute and maybe it wasn't them? I thought about that for a minute and I looked at her and said, no. And the reason it had never entered my mind that it wasn't them is because I knew that I wasn't okay. But I believed with all my heart that as soon as I found the right partner, I would be okay. So all that five failed marriages meant was that I had not yet found the right partner. Because I was so still, so ashamed of myself with all the success that I believed that nothing good could come from inside of me. It would have to come to me from outside of me. So my partner would have to make my life okay. Being at the end of my rope, <clears throat> I went into therapy with a woman therapist. I had always been very open-minded about therapy. If you, I was sponsoring you and you came to me and told me you were going to see a therapist to get some additional help, I immediately fired you as a baby. I told you the truth without even knowing I was telling you the truth. I said, well, obviously, AA and I aren't enough. Find another sponsor. 
So when it came time for me to go, I was ashamed, I was embarrassed, I was very concerned, but I had no choice but to do what the book gives me permission to do. Go seek help from outside professionals that are available to us, okay? So I go see this woman, I walk in her office, I sit down, she says, tell me a little about, starting with your childhood, tell me a little bit about yourself. I say, well, at 15 years of age, they threw me out of manual arts high school. I discovered the wonderful world of drugs and alcohol. I spent the next 11 years drinking, using, bringing drugs in from Mexico, and I <clears throat> went into AA 17 years ago, and I've been clean and sober for 17 years. She said, I, didn't, you're, I said, start with your childhood. She said, you weren't born at 17 or 15. I said, well, I don't remember any of my childhood. At this point in my life, I'd written 32 inventories. They all started at 15. No one said a thing to me. Why not? Because they couldn't remember back past 15 either. So none of us thought it was unusual. We just thought that's when your memory began. You know, at 15. Prior to that, it just sort of got washed out in adolescence with all the rest of the agony of adolescence. And when I told her that, she got this strange smile on her face. And I was a bit of a cynic. I thought the smile meant she was going to call the Rolls Royce dealer and tell him that she'd take the full leather interior because she had somebody who was going to be paying for it. I had no idea that her smile was, she was saying to me, Bob, if you've got the courage to stick this out, I'm going to be here one day when you meet yourself, and that's going to be a very powerful moment. Well, I had the courage, and I stuck it out. Well, what did we do in that office, that woman and I, that we weren't doing in AA? What we did is I had spent 17 years of my life making amends, helping others, you know, not drinking, making up for what I had done as an alcoholic and as an addict. What we did in this woman's office is we tried to find out what was done to me. The first phase of my recovery was over. I had made my amends, I had written my steps, I had gone to my meetings, I had stayed clean and sober. Do I love AA? You know, people say, oh man, he hates AA. You know, he's trying to tear AA apart. God, yes, I love AA. It's my life. I mean, it kept me sober 17 years with the baggage that I was carrying. A sexually abused child, a beaten child, a destroyed child, a child who was slow in school and humiliated and embarrassed in class because I couldn't think fast. Of course I couldn't think fast. I'm getting the crap kicked out of me at home for thinking fast. I had to slow down to save my life. I got teacher's ass writing on a blackboard, Bobby. Two plus two, what is that? Well, what they don't know is I got a lot of stuff to work out before I give them the answer, you know. The first thing I got to decide is why does she want to know, you know. <clears throat> Because I'm getting asked stuff at home, and I'm getting killed when I give them the answer, so I don't want to just throw out an answer here. Second thing i got to figure out is, does she know? See? Because I'm getting asked questions at home, and they don't know the answer, and when I give them the right answer, I'm getting slugged anyway, you know? So it's a losing thing. Well, while I'm sitting in class, and I'm trying to figure all this out, sitting next to me, of course, is Susie. Now, Susie is the family hero. This girl is going to give her family self-worth by getting straight A's for the next 60 years of her life, right? Susie can't stand the silence. It's killing her that a question has been asked and unanswered, right? So when she can't stand it one second longer, she jumps up out of her seat and says, Four, teacher! Teacher, of course, tells Susie how wonderful she is <laughs> and looks at me like I crawled out from underneath a rock, sends home another note about my potential and my slowness, 
and I spend all research trying to fi recess trying to figure out a way to kill Susie. Because Susie has done the one unforgivable thing in my life. She has called public attention to the fact that I am flawed. And I can't stand that. So what I discovered in this lady's office is that a lot of the things that were happening to me in my sober life were a direct result of what happened to me before my sober life. And I had to start feeling feelings. And I find it fascinating today that they says real clear in the big book, when talking about writing an inventory, it says here we put down our feelings. Our feelings. I've never heard a lead in AA or an NA or CA that the person talking didn't make when discussing their first encounter with whatever, whether it was alcohol or cocaine or drugs, didn't say something like the following. It made me feel better. It made me feel okay. It made me feel taller. It made me feel sexy. Made me feel bad. But somehow, that encounter with that substance for the first time altered their feelings altered mine, saved my life. The first time I drank some wine and smoked some grass was the first memory I have of feeling okay. I felt okay. Wow. See? So in this woman's office, we begin to look at my feelings. Anger. <gasps> I had a lot of it. Big time. Sadness. Terrible sadness. One day after about three years, I walked into her office and she said to me, she said, today, Bob, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about Taylor. Taylor was my wife who had died. It was about three hours later when I left her office. And I had cried and I had screamed and I had yelled and I had felt the pain of somebody who cared about me being gone never to return and I felt the pain that somebody I cared about was dead <sighs> terrible thing grieving man it hurts like hell I have a dear friend in the program <clears throat> who's written a very powerful book about grieving because he was a sober was and is a sober member of AA and one day he had a baby his wife had a baby. And three days after the baby was born, the little boy, the baby died. And he went to meetings and they said, turn it over. And he went to meetings and they said, the baby's with God. He went to meetings and he, they said, you can have another. And after about three weeks of that, John found himself, he was a vet with a rather, you know, shaky history as it went sitting under the pier in Santa Monica with a 357 Magnum revolver in his mouth and he was going to blow his brains out. And a, a little voice said to him, No, nah, John, man, this isn't it. Cry your pain. And he learned about grieving and how to say goodbye. I went home from this encounter with my therapist and I spent the next three days locked up in my apartment. By now I'm 20 years clean and sober. I couldn't get off the floor. It was so bad. Of course, I'm grieving a lot of stuff, you know. I mean, that's the terrible thing about getting in touch with feelings in recovery. We don't just have a feeling, you know. I start to get a little bit angry, justifiably so, and out of the storeroom comes 40 years of unexpressed anger, you know. It's like... <laughs> It was like crying, you know, the first little tear would start to fall and this stored up 3,000 gallons of tears would say, hey guys, man, wake up, let's go, there's the opening, you know. And so I'm watching a stupid McDonald's commercial on the floor sobbing in the living room. <laughs> oh my God, I can't stand it, 
you know, thinking, oh, Bob, you're never going to make it. Something's awfully wrong with you. Nah, nothing wrong. Just old stuff needed to get out of me, you know. I crawled around that apartment, I cried and I died and I yelled and I screamed and I beat the floors and I felt the pain. I felt the pain. I emerged three days later a little lighter, a little cleaner, a little clearer and a little more in love with myself for having the courage. Well, here it is now, <clears throat> 13 years since the day I walked into that woman's office, 30 years since the day I walked in the door of AA. What is my life like today? It's actually today's a great day. I had a really good day today, man. It's a great day. As I said, Mrs. Earl number seven, the longest so far. And we have, even better than that, we have a small person, four years old, named Sasha, who is our daughter. <laughs> who sleeps one night a month in her bed and the other 29, months, 29 nights a month in our bed. And when I got on the phone with Pat on Thursday and was informed that it was twin beds in the dorm, I said, fix it. <laughs> we are getting away from this child from the first time in four years, and I, I do not want twin beds. <laughs> so, Diane, thank you for the use of your house. Sorry about the broken bed. Say the truth will set you free. <laughs> so now I want to talk about <clears throat> our four-year-old Sasha for a minute because she has become the strongest, most powerful teacher in my life today. She's being raised a lot differently than I was being raised not because I'm a better mother or father than my mother or father, but because I have a staggering amount of information that they didn't have. That's all. I know more, because I've gone on a search to get more information, to find out why I believe what I believe and find out what works and what doesn't work. This child has never been struck. Would she would go into a shock if anyone was to strike her today after over four years of her life no one striking her. She rarely has been yelled at, maybe a dozen times in four years. I'm the worst perpetrator of that, and that really breaks my heart when I do that. But the fact that I don't hit her is a miracle, because that's the only answer I know. And I usually want to, when she's crying or won't do what I want her to do, my first instinct is to hit this child, because I was hit, that's all I know. That's how I was dealt with. I mean, my mother battered me so bad, I missed so much school. The first year of school, they wouldn't even give me a grade because I was so beaten she couldn't let me out in public. She couldn't let people see what had happened to me. And there are people in recovery who would like me to think that's not important. There are people in recovery who would like me to think I should just forget about it and walk on down the road. Maybe you can. And, and, I'm, and, you know, and I'm all for you if you can. But that stuff was killing me. You know, so it's not okay for me to forget it. It's not okay for me to ignore it. And had I forgotten it, and had I ignored it, my daughter today would be a victim of the same kind of child rearing that I got. I couldn't have changed. I lovingly refer to my wife as, as my witch. Oh, this is really love, but I guarantee you, if there's six women gathered somewhere burning bat wings, she'll be there, man. 
if they got drums and they're doing a dance around a tree under a full moon, you know, with Indian chants and incense, she'll be there, guaranteed. Well, the thing I really love about that is she passes that on to our child. So I have a four-year-old daughter who likes to sit out in the desert at night and look at the stars and see the moon and feel the breeze on her face and listen to the little critters running under the cactus. I have a four-year-old daughter, man, who loves the home, Earth. I have a four-year-old daughter who's going to grow into an exceedingly powerful woman, and she cares about the planet that she lives on. And she cares about it so deeply because her mom gives her that. They spend hours together learning about things that grow and about the power of Mother Earth and the beauty of life and the importance of life. See? She doesn't, get, she doesn't watch TV. I mean, she doesn't watch commercial TV. You know, she likes movies a lot. We've seen um, Beauty and the Beast nine times. She, of course, doesn't have any compulsive, obsessive genes in her. <laughs> now, we're realists, believe me. We're putting aside a bail bond fund before the college fund, you know. <sighs> One night when we were living in a small town in northern Arizona, which is a long story I won't go into in one of the most miserable periods of our life, <laughs> we were out walking one night with our tw then 20-month-old daughter, Sasha. These people gave me this beautiful bear, and this, this shirt says, walk self and carry me, and then you're going to find out exactly what that means right now. She would walk, she was into this phase of her life at 20 months old that she called walk self. Now what walk self mean was don't put your hand on my shoulder to hurry me up. Don't hold my hand and make me walk faster than I want to go. Or my biggie, which is don't put three fingers at the back of my head and sort of scoot me along. And we would be doing one of those things with her, and she would spin around and look up at us and go, walk self. You know, <laughs> like, leave me alone. I got my speed, my pace, and it's perfect for me. So if you want to walk with me, you go my speed, right? So we're strolling up the road, and we live out way out in the country, and the town is surrounded by these tabletop mountains, these mesas. And on this night, there was a full moon just sitting on top of one of the mesas, like a plate on its side. And we're walking up the road towards this moon, and she's walking self in between us, so we're kind of strolling along real easy. And suddenly, out of nowhere, this child starts going like this like an old-fashioned lawnmower with her arms. And she goes, oh, she says, Sasha's flying. She keeps looking at the moon and keeps walking. She says, oh, Sasha's flying in the air. Oh, she goes, Sasha is flying. Oh, she says, Sasha's holding the moon. Tina and I looked at each other with tears streaming down our face. And we said, my God, you know what? No one has ever stepped on this child's spirit. Her spirit may be so free that she, in fact, just flew to the moon. And one thing, yeah. And the other thing about her, the biggest message she's given me is feelings. She arrived straight from God with a full package of feelings. No one taught her any of them. She's capable of getting very angry. I mean seriously angry. I can remember her six months old sitting there in the middle of the floor with her fists doubled up so tight they were blue, she'd cut off the circulation, right? She furrowed her brow. She's screaming at the top of her lungs. Her face is bright red. This spot here is white because she cut the circulation off here, too. And she'd be sitting there, 
And then she'd realize she was all constricted, so she'd throw her arms back, throw her head back, throw herself back on the floor, spread eagle, and really let it rip, you know? We would tell her we loved her, step over, go into the kitchen and do whatever the hell it was we were going to do, you know? I watched her learn to express her anger appropriately. A couple of months later, she would be doing the same thing. Sitting there, fist double, brow furred, face red, screaming at the top of her lungs, and she'd realize she was constricted, and she'd throw her arms out, throw her head back, and then she'd go... <laughs> yeah, you got it. A couple of times she'd been a little too close to the wall. <laughs> you know? See? <clears throat> And she worked that out all by herself. Sadness, her grandmother just died. We had my wife's mother living with us for two and a half years. She just died in September. This little child sat down in her tears and she said, I miss my Dee Dee, I miss my Dee Dee. One night in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning, the blood curdling scream came out of her room and I swore to God, I thought somebody was branding her with a branding iron. If her pain sounded so severe. And we ran into this little tiny girl's room, and she was sitting up in bed, and she was screaming a scream that scared me to death. Man, it came from someplace in her eye. I'd never heard anything come from me before. And she didn't want to be touched. She didn't want to be held. She didn't want to be nothing. She wanted to sit and scream her scream. It went on for almost 20 minutes. And she stopped screaming, and the tears started to come down her face, and she looked at my wife and I, and she said, I'm upset because my Dee Dee is gone. Her grandmother could hardly even hold her. She wasn't an affectionate woman. But that was the depth of the pain of this child, that her Dee Dee was gone. So... Here I am, the AA heretic, the controversial Bobby E., the terrible speaker who has had the audacity to go to a therapist, Ugh! not man enough to pull myself up by my bootstraps and work them damn steps and even use them to fix my automobile, you know. <clears throat> and why? Because something in me just keeps crying out for more. I want to feel better. Why did I stop smoking? Because I didn't get sober to kill myself. You know, that's all. No big deal. But in my heart, you see, I want what my four-year-old daughter's got. See, this is what I want from this program in my life today. I want to walk self, and I want to fly to the moon. I'll tell you what, AA can be very proud of Bob Earl. I am a fine representative of this program. Some of us just went back <clears throat> to Washington a while back to talk to a Senate committee about alcoholism and the administration's attitude about not wanting to help weak people or perceiving it as a weakness and about eliminating the criminalization of drug addiction, and I am a fine representative, I am a dad, and I'm a husband, and I'm socially aware today, and I'm conscious of what goes on, and if it makes me mad, I write a postcard, and I care about who runs for government, and it breaks my heart that it's 1992, and that women and children still aren't safe in their homes, you know? That stuff, you see? what? <clears throat> And I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm not here to tell you what to believe. But I believe in my heart that this is what they intended when they said in the big book that AA wasn't meant to be my whole life. It was meant to restore me to life. Alcoholics Anonymous has put me out in the world, and I am a powerful presence, pal, let me tell you. You know? And I've got a lot to say. And I know this for a fact because it's happened to me and it's happened to my wife. If you work these steps, you go to these meetings and you follow your heart, and if you get stuck, you need more help, you got my permission to go get it, pal. You know? And no one, no living person in this program has the right to tell you not to. That's not how we do it here. Okay? 
And I see AA and ACA and CODA and all the rest of these meetings as just little groups from God to help us move on down the road. I do not see them as a threat to the family, believe me. The, our family is fine, it's strong, it's healthy, and if you follow your heart, I guarantee you, you will walk self, and you will fly to the moon. God bless you.